So welcome back from the, uh, the break, which was sponsored by Wiley. Thank you for that. Um, we now have a session talking about open access books and journals, which I think is going to be, um, going to be really interesting, um, both a kind of research-based um, view about open access books, which I think is always nice to have some data behind these things, um, and then a uh, disciplinary community uh, perspective on uh, open access mega journals. So without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Ros Pine, uh, who uh, essentially needs no interruption. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm Ros Pine. I'm head of policy and development um, at for open research at Springer Nature, and as part of this, I head up our open access books program. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a study that we did last year, looking at how making books open access affected their usage, their citations, their online mentions, and also their wider reception. So I'm just going to start with a very quick recap of, of what we do in OA Books at Springer Nature. This will be the only slide which focuses heavily on our portfolio, I promise. Um, so we've been publishing open access books for about five years, so since 2012 for Springer and since 2013 for Palgrave Macmillan, and those two portfolios were brought together by the merger of Springer Nature in 2015. We publish across a very wide range of subject areas, so Palgrave focuses on the humanities and social science, but in the Springer portfolio, we publish across the full breadth of subjects, including also engineering, science, technical, and so forth. Um, we publish essentially a, a range of standard book types, so monographs, edited collections, proceedings. We publish short form books, which are somewhere between a, a book and a journal article, and we also publish OA chapters in hybrid books. Since 2015, um, everything's been CC by default, and in fact, since 2013 for Palgrave. And we have a model of maximum OA, so we make all of our electronic versions available open access, the PDF, the HTML, the EPUB, and in most cases, an Amazon version. There's print on demand, and we've published more than 450 OA books so far. So we've been publishing OA books for a few years, and we started to think, well, what are the effects of open access for books? And it was also a question that came up a lot from authors when we were talking to them about the possibility of publishing open access with us. You know, well, I like this idea and it sounds good, but you know, what are the actual tangible benefits for me? So we figured, you know, what difference does it make? It would be really interesting to find this out. And we're kind of in a, an unusual position of being able to, to do this now in that we've got a few years of data, and because we're also a traditional publisher of books and we have a substantial non-open access book portfolio, we're in a position to make a comparison between the two. And I think a lot of OA books publishing, by no means all, but a lot has been done by new entrants which are OA only. But we thought we, wanted, we would take advantage of the fact that we had this traditional portfolio of non-OA books and see what we could find in terms of the differences. So we devised a study. So, as I've said, one key part of the study would be quantitative. So we wanted to understand, does OA affect downloads and how much? Does it affect citations? Does it affect where content is mentioned in news, in policy documents, on social media? But we were also very mindful of not going too strongly down the quantitative route, particularly because books are so important for the humanities and social sciences. We're not convinced that in all cases that purely quantitative metrics are the right ways to judge impact or the only ways to judge impact. And so as part of the study, we devised a broader qualitative scheme. And last summer, we spent a lot of time talking to our open access authors and to funders of our open access books about their motivations and experiences. Um, and I will say we didn't talk to the non-open access authors, so we don't have a comparative element for that, um, but we did try to get a range of authors across different geographies, different subjects, and in terms of funders, we picked some big, well-known funders, but we also picked some smaller institutes and organizations that we work with directly on OA books that don't necessarily have a headline policy, but who have supported OA with us. 
Okay, so the next bit of this presentation is about to get very chart heavy, um, but I'm gonna try and talk through them step by step, and hopefully you'll find the, the detail worthwhile. Um, so, downloads. Um, so, this chart here shows chapter downloads from the Springerlink platform. So to be clear, when we talk about a download of a book, every chapter is counted as an individual download. Um, it's just Springerlink, and um, so nothing from third-party platforms that we work with. And you can see that the, the turquoise shows open access, and the dark blue shows non-open access. And we looked at how many downloads there had been at specific points after publication, so after the first month, after the first six months, after the first year, and so on. Um, so you can see that those in the bar charts, the specific points, and we've also put the cumulative um, average on here. Okay, so that's a lot of preamble. What's the actual finding? Um, we found there were just under 30,000 chapter downloads per OA book within the first year of publication. And that's seven times more than for the average non-OA book. So it's a really substantial difference. We also found that at every point we looked at in these first four years of data, OA books did better than non-OA books. And as you can see, that difference is really front-loaded, so OA books get a huge advantage in the early um, period after publication. After six months, after a year, they're really significantly ahead of non-open access books in terms of downloads. Whereas if you look at the non-OA books, the downloads are steadier over the first four years. Um, moving on then. We also looked at downloads by subject. We wanted to get a sense of whether these download trends were consistent or whether we could see differences according to the subject area. For ease and just to make the project manageable, we grouped the subjects, so we're not looking at this at a really granular level, but we're just broadly looking at humanities and social sciences, and as I'll come to on fo the following slides, at business and economics, which we split out um, at, um, uh, biomedical and life sciences, um, and at sort of engineering and maths. So we can broadly group things into to four areas. So on this slide, you can see that the trend lines uh, that are dashed are the trend lines that are carried over from the previous slide. So these are the, the cumulative average of downloads for all non-OA books, the, the top gray line at the top there, and then the cumulative downloads for all non-OA books, the, the white dashed line um, Below. So for humanities and social sciences, what did we discover? You can see immediately that actually humanities and social science books are downloaded less on average than all of our portfolio. However, when we look at the OA comparison, actually it's very similar. So a year after publication, open access books in the humanities and social sciences have received 6.7 times more chapter downloads than non-open access books. So if we then pick this up and look at other subject areas, looking at business, economics, and finance, and we only had three years of data here because it turned out we didn't publish any business, economic, finance books in our, in our first years. Um, again, you can see overall, the downloads are lower than the average for all books. But if you look at the OA comparison, again, it's very similar. We're seeing 6.7 times more downloads in the first year. Moving on to engineering, maths, and computer science, here you can see that the OA books overall get downloaded much more than average, and the, the non-OA books are about average. But here we see, a really, we see a bigger OA advantage, so eight times more downloads, but still not a huge amount of difference from, from the norm that we found um, of seven times more. And then finally, looking at medicine, biomedicine, life sciences, and natural sciences, Again, you can see that there are more downloads overall for both the OA and the non-OA, but again, the usage advantage for OA is similar in that it's seven times more downloads. And you can also see some kind of interesting trends here where the, the life sciences, you can, you can see that immediate usage take up, whereas you get a slightly different trend, for example, for HSS, with a sort of different shaped curve, so kind of interesting usage patterns for, for the books overall. So for citations, we tracked citations via book metrics, which is a spring of nature tool which we developed with Altmetric, which gives authors an overview of the reach, usage, and readership of their book. And it tracks citations in books and articles, and it also tracks online mentions from a variety of different online sources. And for this part of the analysis, we were only able to track uh, books published in the same year. So for the downloads, we could look at it month by month. Here we're, we're going year by year. 
and we found that citations are on average 50% higher for open access books than for non-open access books over a four-year period. So on average, our OA books were cited 12 times and non-OA books were cited eight times. I think this data comes with a bit of a caveat that a four-year period is a pretty short one to be looking at citations, especially for books in humanities and social sciences. And so it's hard to tell whether this is a peak in the fourth year. I would guess that it's not. Um, and we, we'd need further research in later years to really understand what that citation curve looks like. We were interested to see whether there was a relationship between downloads and citations. Does getting a huge increase in downloads significantly affect citations? I think at this point, it's clear that OA Books got both more downloads and more citations, but it's hard to pick out a, a specific kind of correlation between those based on the data that we've got. You can see here um, the solid lines being the the downloads and the dashed lines being the citations, you get that huge peak for downloads for OA books in the first year. And you do continue to see a citation advantage in every year, but it's not clear how closely related that is to the, to the usage um, or, or exactly how the usage relates to citations. And again, I think we need more years of data to be able to unpick this. Finally, in the quantitative section, we looked at online mentions. So as I've said, this is mentions in news, in policy documents, on social media. And again, we tracked this via book metrics. And here we found that in the first three years after publication, OA books are mentioned an average of 30 times. And that's 10 times more than a non-OA book. And here again, you can see that that advantage is hugely front-loaded into the first year. Okay, so enough stats. I'm going to tell you now a little, a little bit about what our authors and funders told us about publishing open access books. So in terms of motivations, our authors told us that they were primarily motivated by the desire for their books to reach the widest possible audience and for them to be shared and cited more than non-open access books. They told us we, they want to make sure that the people who should be reading it, the people who are, for whom this is most relevant to, we want to make sure that they have access. They value the ease of sharing books through the d direct links, which is enabled by OA. And they especially value that in regions where readers might not be able to afford a traditional print edition of the book. Funders and authors alike pointed to ethical motivations. The question of reproducibility came up, something which has been discussed already in this conference. We were told, with open science, it helps that research results can be replicated, verified, falsified, and reused for scholarly as well as practical applications. And one thing we heard a lot from funders was, well, we think that all of these reasons for open access exist for articles, and we can't see a good reason to distinguish books in that. If we think we get all of these benefits for articles, then we really need to stand up and, and put the money behind making books open access, put the policies behind making books open access as well. And we heard a lot about ethical and, and political motivations. Again, the same sorts of arguments that we hear for journals. It's publicly funded research, so I think the public has the right to access those results. Other reasons. We heard a lot about subject matter. So authors publishing on open science itself felt strongly that their books needed to be open access, but also in international development. So anybody who published work that was closely associated with low-income countries, perhaps they had co-authors or significant contributions from there, felt there was a strong ethical motivation for making sure that that work was widely available in the countries that had contributed to and been subject of the research. Some authors told us that they, were, uh, they found appealing the possibility of purchasing a cheap print edition, so we reduced the price of the print because we've, we've taken a lot of the um, costs in, in the BPC. And so that was an attraction. Um, <laughs> and in general, so there were expectations on the part of authors and funders that OA publication would lead to increased citations and downloads. So what happened in practice? I think the thing that really struck us in these interviews was that authors and funders felt insufficiently informed about the effects of open access. You know, we were told again and again, well, we didn't do any analysis. You know, funders were saying, well, yes, we've been funding these programs, but we don't actually know what the effects have been so far. Um, 
And when funders and authors were aware that books had had particularly high downloads, they were reluctant to attribute those solely to open access. So they pointed out the large number of other factors that came into play, the author's reputation, the book's topic, additional marketing activities that had been done for the book. And they noted that these would have an influence on the overall usage and impact of open access books. And it is a, a good point, and I should kind of caveat all of our results with the fact that correlation doesn't necessarily equal causation. We've We've found that there is an association or a, a trend that OA books are downloaded more, but we haven't yet been able to dig into exactly why that is. Perhaps people are choosing different types of books to go open access. Perhaps the sorts of authors that choose to go open access are more engaged. There are a lot of reasons that could be contributing to the, the advantages that OA might be supporting and enabling, but might not be the only factor involved. In general, we found a lot of positivity, though, from authors and funders. Um, a good experience, a good experience of, in many cases, high downloads and accesses, and people telling us that they were more and more convinced that OA was the way to publish in the future. One thing that we'd been interested in was to see if OA might lead to more collaborations. Did it help authors make connections with people who might not otherwise have read their work? Did it help them get involved in other research projects? And this drew a bit of a blank. Authors felt that it was hard to attribute any specific new connections or research projects to the fact that their books have been published open access. Again, I think this goes back to the kind of question of multiple different factors being at play and potentially also that it's early days. But it's something that will be interesting to keep talking about. OK, so what have we learned? The data matches our expectations. We did find an OA advantage, a quite significant one. So seven times more downloads, and 50% more citations, and 10 times more online mentions. But we didn't realize the extent to which authors and funders feel uninformed about the effects of open access. And this led us to think about, well, what can we do better? I think one big thing was metrics across the industry. We need to get better at collecting, reporting, sharing, and standardizing metrics for understanding usage in particular. And this was really driven home to us by uh, a part of our own project where we actually weren't able to include some of the older Palgrave data because the Springer and Palgrave books had been published under different systems until 2015 and had used different means of tracking usage. So the Palgrave books were tracking usage by book. So we couldn't combine the first two years of Palgrave data into the research project. Um, so if we can't do it with our own portfolio, then I think that speaks to the kind of wider challenges that we have across the, the industry. But I think if we, if we want to get better at making the case for OA, we need to get better at having clear metrics that we can explain. And this comes, takes me to the second point, which is communication. We need to get a lot better at supporting authors and funders in understanding the impact of open access books. Again, we're trying to make the case for open access. Certainly we as a publisher really want to encourage the take up of open access across all, all formats, but we also have a responsibility to explain what benefits that is bringing to our authors and to their funders and to our readers. A final thought we had was about discovery routes and how we are ensuring that we best optimize discovery for our books. And one thing we, I wanted to talk about here, particularly in the context of this conference, was collaboration with libraries and aggregators. We realized that a lot of people aren't necessarily reaching books through libraries, but we also know that a lot of them still are. How do we get books into libraries when libraries aren't necessarily subscribing to them? How can we work better with the library community? And we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. OK. so. What next? What didn't we do that we'd have loved to do? What might we want to do in the future? I think the big one is to repeat the same analysis over a longer period. We had four years of data. It was not quite enough, I think, to, to really understand the full citation trends. We're publishing more OA books as year on year. So as we go, we have a bigger data set. So it would be good to come back and just repeat this in a couple of years' time. We'd like to be able to dig into the causation between um, what is causing the, the book's performance? To what extent is OA responsible for these uh, results? To what extent does OA engender other, um, other things? 
We like to analyze the geolocation of usage and referral routes. So we've seen more usage, but where is it coming from? Are we opening up routes to readership in places that wouldn't usually be able to access our books? One thing we initially wanted to do as part of this project, but which we had to exclude because it was just so complicated, was understanding how downloads from third-party hosting platforms might affect this picture. So our books are variously, although not necessarily consistently, on OAPEN, NCBI Bookshelf, Amazon Kindle, and Google Books. All of those naturally have different ways of measuring downloads and different ways of, of kind of reporting that data. But it would be really interesting to understand how that fits into the picture because OA shouldn't be just about people accessing it from our platform. We'd like to look at citations and online mentions by subject to area, and we'd also like to broaden out the conversation about what impact means for open access books. So if I've piqued your interest, then you can download the full report from our website, and it's got all the information about the methodology, exactly how we can, have, which books we include and excluded, um, a lot of links to related reports. So I would encourage you to go and take a look. Um, thank you. And oh, and I've been asked to make sure that you follow our Twitter feed, <laughs> um, which I believe Christina will be tweeting via the r conference um, hashtag. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, thank you. And um, I'm going to be talking about open access mega journals as a potentially disruptive innovation in the scholarly communication system. So I'm going to talk about um, particular disciplinary case studies that were part of a wider AHRC-funded project. So this is the project team. It was a collaboration between Sheffield and Loughborough universities. So I'm sure most of you have heard of open access mega journals and know what they are. But for those of you that don't, um, they're basically um, fully access, open access journals typically based on the APC business model. They're large scale or aiming for it. So the first open access mega journal was PLOS One. Now PLOS One and Scientific Reports are the two largest journals in the world. They have broad disciplinary scope. So for example, PLOS One is all of the physical sciences and also includes some of the social sciences. And um, one of the sort of messages um, put forth by advocates of OA mega journals was that they would support interdisciplinary research. They present a new approach to peer review, which is for technical or scientific soundness only. So peer reviewers are asked to review on the robustness of the methodology, the quality of the data, the extent to which the conclusions are supported by those datas, data, and to not comment on significance or importance to the discipline, that that is something that takes place post-publication via commenting on um, Articles. Now, we happen to know that actually post publication activity around social media and comments is actually quite limited, but that's, that's not for today's um, talk. <clears throat> so, the project ran for 26 months. It had um, five phases around empirical data collection. Um, so phase two was the bibliometrics um, aspect. So we were looking at mega journal characteristics, and we've published that research in a couple of article papers. Phase three looked at publisher perspectives. So we did about 25 interviews with publishers and editors. Again, that research has been um, published. I'm going to talk about phase um, four. And then the final phase of data collection was phase five, which was a large scale um, online survey of authors, those that had published in open access journals, those that had not. So the focus of phase four was to develop 
um, an understanding of current publication practices and to explore the significance of open access mega journals in a disciplinary context. We asked participants things like factors influencing journal choice, strategies when an article is rejected, so that got quite a few laughs in the um, focus groups, experience, if any, of publishing in an open access mega journals. We actually expected that the majority of our participants would not have published in an open access mega journal. Views on review for technical scientific soundness only, and the role of journals in filtering for significance for the discipline. So we looked at um, four disciplines across five institutions. We chose these disciplines to represent a spread across the physical and social sciences and the humanities. We also chose disciplines that we knew had been first movers in adopting mega journals, so biosciences, for example, and also disciplinary communities where we expected to be a sort of a moderate uptake based at sort of looking at the representation of disciplines in the various open access mega journals, so astronomy and physics and education. And we chose a discipline from the humanities where we, ex we expected absolute minimum adoption of open access mega journals and actually where we know there's relatively low levels of adoption of um, OA, although of course that's changing as Ross's um, talk uh, shows. So these are the um, participants. So we had 24 bioscientists, 15 astronomers and physicists. It was the way we recruited. We ended up with focus groups of astronomers and physicists. 17 education researchers. And we really struggled to um, recruit historians, unfortunately. So we only had sort of four historians. So they were more like interviews and focus groups. I can talk about some of the um, recruitment issues we had during the Q&A session or after the break, but basically we recruited participants by using um, academic, school and department mailing lists. <clears throat> so, we asked um, questions around what influenced journal choice in terms of where to publish, and as we um, heard yesterday in Maria Bond's talk, reaching a specific target audience or having a readership in mind is a sort of main driving practice. Sometimes there are payoffs for researchers in terms of going for a broad scope journal that might have a higher impact factor, greater brings greater prestige for the author and higher visibility over going for a more specialist niche journal title where the reporting can be more in-depth and where authors feel that they're reaching a specific um, community. These are all UK researchers, so um, the response to many of our questions came back as, well, the REF. <laughs> the REF is the overriding factor it's becoming more important than reaching a, um, a target audience or readership. And despite efforts that have been made to communicate to researchers that actually ref review panels are not supposed to take the journal title into consideration, that it's about the underlying quality of the research, researchers overwhelmingly felt that the journal impact factor was really important when they were considering where to publish. The exception to that was um, in history and to a certain extent education where the, the, the GIF holds um, less currency. So consequently, for authors in terms of thinking about where to publish, whether to use a new sort of innovative form of scholarly communication, there are tensions, there are payoffs in the decisions they make. And I'm going to come back and talk about um, those tensions. So we heard in the panel this morning the importance of community. That was about the role of learned societies in um, a sort of a disciplinary community. So this quote um, is to sort of 
illustrate that even though we've had lots of innovations in um, scholarly communication, I was involved in a RIN, a research information network funded project, I think back in 2009, when we looked at um, what might be the effect of the REF on publication and citation practices. We found then that journals were still really important. We found again that journals are really important. So this is an education researcher. Um, journals represent a community of people working on issues driven to address certain inequalities. If you take that out and treat it as a medium to put text into the world, I think you're really losing something important about how disciplines evolve and how you get movements of scholars. So this was talking about the filtering role of journals and reviewing for technical scientific soundness only. And education researchers in particular talked about the notion of an ongoing conversation and the importance of peer review and reviewing for significance and importance as part of that filtering role. So, I've been studying com scholarly communication for about 15 years now and have an interest in a field called genre analysis. And some of you may have heard of John Swell's notion of discourse communities. And in analysing the focus group um, data, it really resonated for me for the first time, really, this quite is sort of quite abstract conceptualization. So a discourse community has a set of shared goals, has forums for communication between members, so meetings, correspondence, email for um, scholars, of course, that's conferences, um, journals. And it's this, you know, number three here, ongoing conversations through active participation in providing information and feedback. I was also, um, I was PI on a um, European funded project looking at researcher behaviours and green, green open access. And um, this sort of kind of sort of notion of an ongoing um, conversation and the role of peer review. So for the peer project, again, we did large scale survey, we did focus groups and researchers were saying peer review is really important. And we're thinking, why, why, what, what is it? Because it's so heavily criticized as being, can be biased. Um, in economics, for example, the peer review process takes a very long time. It can be competitive. Researchers can um, be concerned about ideas getting stolen. And indeed, the bioscientists in the focus groups would say, well, I wouldn't submit a manuscript to this particular journal title because I know so-and-so on the editorial board working in a similar area, and I would be concerned about them stealing my ideas. So for me, three starts to explain why peer review continues to be um, important. Recognise genres for communication, so the journal article, the peer reviewers report, the conference proceedings. So we have lots of genres in scholarly communication, a specialised vocabulary or a language, and a critical mass of members. You've got your early career researchers, your emeritus um, professors. So it's started me to think about ways in which to sort of make sense of the data. Now, researchers have to understand the journal landscape. We kind of take it for granted that researchers know the journal landscape. At the focus, um, one of the education focus groups, the participants were talking about why they might submit a particular type of journal article to one journal title over another. And an early career researcher said, you know, she literally exclaimed, she said, how do you know that? How do you know if you've written something qualitative using this theorist, you submit it to this journal? And some of the participants in the room had gone through a mentoring process. They said, oh, we get this through mentoring. She was part of the institution that didn't have the mentoring. So we take it for granted. But as being an active member of a discourse community, researchers have to gain quite nuanced, detailed understanding of the journal landscape. We also talked a lot about the difference between the community view of prestige, so it might be you know, the sort of 
lists that go around of, you know, my school has a, a list of these are the top tier journals, you know, the sort of the perceived pecking order, as opposed to the more objective um, journal rankings based on metrics. And we had conversations about, of course, those metrics, something like the journal impact factor, not being the same thing as prestige, but researchers struggle to actually pin down what is prestige, what is it, what's the definition of that. So, as I said, publishing in the highest impact or most prestigious journal is an important um, driver. I've italicised driver there because I'm not quite sure about that term driver, whether it's driver, motivation, but reaching and engaging with a um, particular community is also inextricably linked to journal choice. <coughs> So, um, I thought I would sort of unpick this notion of community. It's something that the um, focus group data really came to. And you get different levels of community. So the institution, the discipline, the science system, so um, research, funding, agencies, government um, policy on research, and society. So we started to think about, when you start to think about different um, levels of community, you start to think about the different motivations of authors in addressing the drivers of those communities. So if a, um, an early career researcher or a postdoc is looking for that first job, then the perception was amongst participants going for the journal with the highest impact factor was highly um, desirable. If um, it's about communicating a particular message to a community, um, then that's a certain kind of drivers. You might be going for a particular sort of niche specialist journal title. If it's about obtaining funding, again, there was a perception that funders, when they're looking at the publication lists of the PI and the COI, where articles have been published um, is very important. And if it's about, if you're in the kind of discipline where there's um, a practitioner audience and you're wanting to influence policy and practice, actually a journal with a high impact factor is not necessarily the most appropriate journal because practitioners don't necessarily read those journals. Um, so it creates various kind of payoffs and tensions. Of course, these motivations are not mutually exclusive. Um, so for example, the kind of um, journal you might go for would satisfy, could satisfy institutional and kind of societal community level motivations. <coughs> So, thinking about this in the context of awareness of open access mega journals. So, the term was um, unfamiliar, and actually, quite a few of the bioscientists had published in things like PLOS One Scientific Reports, um, PJ, but they just weren't familiar with the term open access mega journals, but they recognised the PLOS One um, model. Um, there were various views on mega journals. I think largely depending on whether uh, researchers had published in them or not, but here we have a bioscientist saying, big online journals that just churn out hundreds of thousands of articles, which kind of touches on the, you know, some um, critics of the open access mega journal model have criticised them as being sort of dumping grounds for trivial kind of um, papers. There was concern about the um, visibility of um, articles appearing in an open access mega journal. So this is quite interesting because this was a quote of an, uh, from an, um, it's either an astronomer or a physicist, I can't remember now, but these are researchers highly likely to be um, publishing in archive, yet feeling that if they publish in a mega journal, that's just not going to be visible. And there was discussions about, well, does it matter if, you know, do re readers really look at 
the contents of an article anymore unless it's a society journal. So lots of conversations around society journals being the only journals that researchers read from cover to cover these days. It will be visible on Google. But there were concerns about sort of articles being lost in the noise in this um, mega environment. They were seen as facilitators of OA publishing, so good for OA publishing in general. That was the view of um, a particular sort of bioscience focus group. And that they were pioneers of access to supplementary and supporting data. And that they were a positive challenge to um, an increasingly impact and metric-driven publishing system. So as well as the focus groups with researchers, we, I, I also interviewed Pro Vice Chancellors for Research at the five institutions where we conducted um, focus groups. All of the five institutions were research intensive universities. They'd, they were all signatories of DORA. So they all said things like all the journal impact factors not important when we evaluate um, researchers um, output for hiring or promoting them. So we have here the quote, if someone had published in a mega journal, that is neither a positive or a negative. What counts is the content of the paper and our judgment of the quality of the work so that each it's kind of qualitatively reviewed. It's interesting um, that this is quite different to the, review, to the view of the focus group participants who really felt that the journal impact factor was going to be important when they were going for promotion or when their postdocs were applying for their first job. So there's um, a contradiction there in terms of message getting through from research managers to researchers. So views on soundness only peer review evoked um, lots of discussion, um, particularly around current uh, limitations in the peer review system. I've talked about you know, some of the issues with the sort of delays in peer review ideas potentially getting um, scooped. Bioscientists and astronomers were supportive in principle of soundness only peer review. They felt that it might overcome the kind of sexy topic syndrome that happens with journals like Nature and Science. And you know, in bioscience, some areas are certainly seen as more um, sexy than others. Okay. So again, this sort of coming back, this quote comes back to the filtering role of um, journals and the peer review system. So a potential problem is just the proliferation of lots of studies that do really very little. There's so much out there already, it seems important to do some of that sifting. So the education researchers um, really felt that the peer review for importance or significance was important. Right, so now we've thought about mega journals. So going back to um, this model now about thinking about levels of community, the various motivations, and then the sort of arguments here is that the article plays a differential role depending on what the main motivations are. So, and its career is not the main motivation for, for all, all researchers. So, but if that's the case, the article is going to signify researcher quality and productivity. If it's to communicate a particular message to the discipline, it's providing a contribution to the discourse. If it's about obtaining funding, it's signifying an expert in the field. If it's about influencing policy and practice, and about socioeconomic impact, it's a vehicle for that social impact. Of course, the role of the journal article and journal characteristics are very closely interwoven. So, um, a journal that has a reputation for robust, high-quality peer review 
facilitates the um, role of an article being a signifier of researcher quality in the same way that peer review, the scope of a journal and its um, sort of perceived prestige will have on facilitating a researcher making a contribution to the discourse. Again, we've got um, peer review, journal metrics and prestige, facilitating that the article signifying an expert in the field, and peer review, audience readership, and open access status, a vehicle for social impact. So it's just interesting in terms of the focus group data, just the focus group data, OA status is the only factor that came up um, as important for the societal impact. Um, okay. So, in conclusion, journals play a central role within disciplinary communities. We know that, nothing surprising now in, in that, but the model, I think, helps to explain why that is. Um, they shape and are shaped by those communities. Um, the different level of community will place different values on journal characteristics. So I think it's why we get lock-in to particular models and why the scholarly communication system is quite um, conservative and difficult to shift, as um, publishers and librarians will know. And that academic authors are balancing these competing factors when they make um, their choice about where to publish. Where there were negative perceptions of the open access um, mega journal model, these may stem from a belief that it fails to adequately meet the needs of the various levels of community, because mega journals have the broad scope. They might be facilitating inter interdisciplinary conversations, but they're not targeting towards a particular audience. They have you know, various um, journal impacts. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Well, that's great. Thank you both. We've got uh, plenty of time for questions, and I'm sure these uh, presentations have provoked some uh, potential questions from the audience. So um, I can prattle on for a bit while you think about some questions, but let me see if there are any raised hands immediately to ask questions. Okay, I'm going to give you time to think for a moment. I'm just going to tell you a, a small, important piece of news. Um, so, Roz Pine also wins this year's award for the shortest name on a name badge. Um, for those of us who are very concerned about delegate lists and name badges and formatting of such things, this is an important uh, competition. Um, and Alison Fox, are you in the room somewhere? Alison? You've missed an opportunity, Ali, to go for the top prize there. Uh, just... So close. Next year, you, you can really be a competitor, I think. Um, on the longest name, uh, once again, that award goes to uh, Celia Heyman widmark um, Congratulations from KTH in Sweden for the longest name. So that's a, definitely a triumph and a repeat prize winner there. So thank you for that. Right, you've had a chance to think of some questions now. So raise your hands. Somebody will bring you a microphone. And uh, if you could identify yourself and then ask your question. Um, Go ahead, or I'll have to ask you a question. Um, yes, Anna, in the middle there. Um, did you ask them anything about the difference between different mega journals, or was it all all them all together? Um, it was all together. We don't we didn't go into um, specifics. So it was the mega journals they said they had published in, if they had published in. Yeah, but the um, one focus group in particular, there was one bioscientist who said that actually she was planning, she had submitted, she had had an article published in PLOS One, I think it was PLOS One, but next time round she was going for PJ because she felt PJ was on the rise in terms of impact factor and she liked their pricing model, yeah. Okay, uh, next question. Um, further towards the back on the right there. Given, given that there is an interest in, or a concern for discoverability in mega journals, did people uh, have a lot of awareness of sort of collections and channels that might be available in those mega journals, or are those not very commonly known about? 
So, sorry, could you give me an example of the kind of collections you mean? Sure, yeah, I mean, like, PLOS One has channels and collections that highlight specific right. types of research, okay. for example. Okay, okay. So, I think that um, only came up in the bioscience focus groups where the, there were participants who had published and knew those journals quite well. But across the board, that, that didn't come up. So, there seemed to be a lack of awareness of those yeah. Okay, next question, someone else? So I'll ask Ros a question while we're looking for the next question, which is you talked about, um, uh, I've made a note here, um, assessing causation of, mm. of the open access side. Um, do you have any thoughts on how you're going to do that, of how you can have a sort of control group of open access books that is identical to a different group of paid books or something? I mean, how are you going to figure that one out? I mean, I think it would be very difficult to, to do it in as rigorous a way as that. I think what I'd like to do is have a little look at the kind of the set of OA books as a whole and try and understand to what extent they are representative of kind of our wider set. So I don't know if we would actually kind of at this stage be able to repeat the analysis with a kind of identical data set, particularly because we might not at this point have enough books mm. uh, because we'd have to start excluding things. But I would just like to understand a bit more how representative our OA books data set okay. is. All right. Something I have seen in another context, I'm not sure it would work for this, is actually a, a sort of narrowing approach where you try and pair things mm. that are comparable but, but in the different groups. And if you pair them carefully, then you can compare the pairs as to how they perform against each other. But, yeah, yeah, I think I'd worry about sort of exceptionalism in that, mm. in a sort of sense that one thing we really wanted to do here was try and take the, that sort of broad sweep, and we, we did actually exclude a few really high performers from those trends, which were sort of skewing right. very far out of the, um, the sort of general trends, and to try and get a sense of what does it look like collectively. Mm. Okay. But, Thank you. All right, a uh, question from the floor. Who have we got? Uh, oh, I'm seeing a hand at the back on the right there. Hi there, question for Roz. Uh, I think you were saying that you thought there might be different models to try in terms of charging for open access books. Had you got any thoughts of what they might look like? Did I say that? <laughs> so I think I would say that my personal opinion at this point is that we need a lot of different models for open access books. I don't think anyone's yet found the model. Uh, the landscape of scholarly books is very diverse, especially once you get into the humanities, for which you know, that format is so important. And I think going down any one route risks homogenizing a, a diversity of landscape which, which is so important to those subjects. So it might be that, say, you know, at the moment, we use a, a BPC model. There are obviously library consortium models out there. There are freemium models. And it might be that actually what we need ultimately is a combination of all of these different models in different places with different publishers to serve the broad needs of the scholarly community. I mean, that's my feeling at the moment, that we're not going to kind of end up with this sort of journal-style, heavily APC-dominated landscape for OA books. And the BPC model that we have is one that might, that might evolve, I guess, in the future into other things. It's not something that we're actively looking at at the moment. But it will be interesting also in light of the forthcoming REF mandate. Um, I think that will spark a lot of innovation in this area and a lot of people are already looking in that, but diversity is what we need. I think it's also an issue about type of book. There's a big difference in open access textbook and open access uh, mm -hmm. you know, obscure medical research book in terms of the economics of, of what impact that has on making it open access. Yeah, absolutely. And we haven't really touched undergraduate level textbooks in our, mm. in our open access books. We've done a few graduate level textbooks that sort of look a bit more like monographs in terms of, of how they can behave. But open access for textbooks is a kind of whole other area which needs other models and other approaches, probably. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Rob on the right there. Who's got a microphone for? There we go. Uh, 
Rob Johnson, um, I really enjoyed your, your presentation, Jenny, and I think it talks a lot about attitudes and so on. I see your project is called Mega Journals and the Future of Scholarly Communication. Could you tell us a bit more about the future of scholarly communication or what pointers you, you learned in terms of where things are going? Okay, all right, thank you for that question. That's easy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, okay. I think we're still mulling that over um, and synthesising the var various um, phases. In the interviews with publishers, I know that quite a few publishers were thinking about preprint archives as the future, that if we're living in an unbundled world where the sort of article is unbundled from the journal, why not preprint archives? And that perhaps mega journals are part of that trend, part of a, a shift towards that is going to be quite interesting to see. I think um, preprint servers are having something of a renaissance in some disciplines. Um, I think it also depends a bit on what open access mega journal publishers can do to embed those journals into a community or so that communities feel part of that and we, we heard some examples just now in, in a question about how that's done um, but I think it's about um, publishers uh, sort of adapting perhaps the open access mega journal model. Mm. Ross do you want to have a go at the future as well or are you going to dump that one? <laughs> I mean, I think I would, I would echo Jenny's things about preprints. We've certainly seen a huge rise in preprint servers over the last couple of years and an inc of increasing willingness from both authors and funders to kind of acknowledge preprint pub publication in various forms. So I think we'd have to be alive to how that will change things. Okay. Um, on the left there, John. Uh, John Sack, Highwire Press. Uh, it's interesting to, uh, it's mostly for Jenny, the, uh, that you put together mega journals and preprint servers, because I agree they have some, some common characteristics. Uh, part of what the, the community, at least in the life sciences, has determined is that they don't want to have many, many preprint servers. They wanted to focus on one. Uh, do you think the same? principle applies to mega journals? Is there, if you will, a limit to the number of them uh, after which it becomes impractical to, to launch new ones? I, I'm, that is a really interesting question and I, I'm, don't, I actually don't feel qualified to answer <laughs> that, that question. That's a really interesting question and that I'm not sure of. Part of the reason I asked the question is that uh, uh, there are some consultants in the industry who have said it's it's now too late to launch a new mega journal, uh, and uh, one of uh, Highwire's uh, society publishers has determined that they launched theirs too late. Right. And they launched it about a year ago. So uh, it's just a it's a possibility that we've we've now reached, if you will, max mega. Yeah. It, 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 possibly we've reached a plateau. We have published. Um, an article out of the bibliometric study, and I think that will that was a, sort of an in-depth case study of 11 journals. And I think you, you, it, it's difficult to to see a trend because actually mega journals themselves are not homogenous; they're heterogeneous themselves. Um, but I think yeah, it, it's possible. Okay, we've got time for perhaps two more questions. I know Anthony had one, but he's changed his mind now. But do you have a question? Oh, okay. All right. So, somebody else? Someone in the back? All right. If we're all done. Okay. So, just before I tell you what's happening next, uh, can you join me in thanking uh, Ros Pine and Professor Jenny Fry for their presentation? So what happens next, you'll be thrilled to know, is lunch. Um, lunch is uh, courtesy of, sponsored by uh, my firm, Mosaic, which is, is nice. Uh, in your packs, you'll have a little mosaic leaflet, which is full of entertaining stories of people we've recruited in the past, which I find is kind of personal interest stories. <laughs>